Thank you very much, Ian, and good evening and welcome. Uh, as Ian has already indicated, uh, the Oxford Geoengineering Programme is a remarkably interdisciplinary activity that cuts across the uh, geological sciences, the social sciences, the engineering sciences, and brings in also the humanities. What is geoengineering? Uh, the Royal Society last autumn issued a report on the topic in which it defined geoengineering as the large-scale intervention in planetary systems in order to try to counteract the effects of global climate change. Why would you want to do that? Well, at least one of the answers is represented in the graph here. This shows a range of projections from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for potential temperature rises under varying socioeconomic conditions over the course of the next century. We would like to be on the bottom of this curve. Unfortunately, with emissions worldwide currently growing at about 3% per annum, we're actually on the top of this curve. We seem to be headed to about a 2 degree Celsius temperature rise by mid-century, with a possible 4 degree rise by the end of the century if the trend continues. And it's quite possible that these estimates are wildly optimistic, since built into these are certain assumptions about improvements in energy intensity and carbon intensity, uh, which it turns out uh, have not held true. So one of the things that people are thinking with respect to geoengineering is it would be very handy if we could find ways to shave the peaks of these kinds of emissions profiles whilst pursuing more conventional methods of carbon emissions mitigation. And I want to emphasize that there are almost no serious person working in this field of geoengineering who accepts the Freakonomics uh, guy's idea that this could be actually a substitute for conventional mitigation. But it could well be a way of buying essential time. How might we do it? Well, there's two things you can do to counteract the effects of climate change. And there's two ways you can do either of those things. You can either suck some carbon out of the atmosphere, which is what the Royal Society report described as carbon dioxide removal, or you can reflect a bit of sunlight back into space, uh, which is what the Royal Society described as solar radiation management, or SRM. Now, you can do either of these things, suck carbon out of the atmosphere or reflect it back, in either of two ways. You can enhance some natural processes, or if you prefer, tinker with some natural processes, or you can actually do it through traditional heavy black box engineering. So you can see in the matrix here, for example, ocean fertilization. We know that certain parts of the ocean are less productive of plankton than they might otherwise be, uh, and that the idea here is that by adding iron to those parts of the ocean, one could enhance plankton growth uh, the plankton would take up carbon from the atmosphere, fish would come along, chomp up the plankton, and then the heavy fish poop would sink to the bottom of the ocean. Unfortunately, in the field trials so far, uh, a lot of the uh, plankton were eaten by jellyfish, which have like floaty poop, and the carbon went straight back up again. But nevertheless, this, this is the general principle that you're looking at. Uh, stratospheric aerosols is another uh, potential option. Uh, I say this is a natural si uh, system uh, that we already have. Volcanoes do, in fact, loft. Uh, sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere uh, when they erupt, and we know when Mount Pinatubo erupted, for example, for about a couple of years we had a global two-degree uh, modification of the, uh, the temperature. On the other hand, if you want to do either of these things through black box engineering, you could build big machines, illustrated in the bottom left, that suck carbon out of the atmosphere. By the way, we do this in submarines. It's very expensive at the moment, but it's not entirely uh, uh, inconceivable that well, we could do this on a, a large scale, or put something reflective into space, uh, either large reflectors or more likely probably a myriad of small reflectors. So you have these various options. What are the downsides? Well, one of the downsides is the potential for socio-technical lock-in. If you rely on sulfate aerosols to cool the planet and you continue to emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and then for some reason, such as you discover you've disrupted the Asian monsoon, you decide you have to stop. Then you're likely to get a very sudden and very disruptive temperature rise. So that's a sort of technical lock-in. Now you might say, well, there's not much lock-in with carbon capture machines. You just flick the switch and they go off. 
That's true from a technical point of view, but considering they're likely to be fairly expensive, you can imagine that there's going to be a fairly high degree of institutional lock-in, commitment of vested interests of those who have made the investment in constructing uh, the machinery such that you would have strong pressures, as indeed you do now from the oil and gas industry with respect to fossil fuels, not to turn them off. So there are potential downsides. So how would we manage this uh, area of technology? Do we need an international agreement? Do we need to manage or govern research and development as well as implementation? Indeed, where does the process of research and development in these processes stop and full implementation begin? You start with doing computer models, you go to bench level uh, experiments, you go to field trials, you go to full scale field trials. Hang on, if you're at full scale, haven't you already started implementing the technology? So it seemed to us that there was uh, a necessity to have a set of principles for governing geoengineering that would cover the full range of processes from those early experiments right through to implementation, as well as covering this very wide technological field of possible options. And building on the work of the Royal Society's Geoengineering Working Party, of which I was privileged to be a member, uh, we gathered at Oxford a small group of academics, including uh, colleagues uh, who had been involved in that report, uh, Catherine Regwell from University College London and Nick Pigeon from the University of Cardiff, and proposed uh, to the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee a set of five principles that we felt would govern all of these technologies and could cover this full range of process of research, development, and full implementation. What impact did these have? Well, they were considered at some length by the House of Commons Committee, uh, and we were very pleased to say that the House Committee felt uh, moved to endorse uh, the Oxford Principles as they've become known. Uh, I had the privilege to take these then to a major international meeting at a cinema in California uh, earlier this year, which was an attempt by the geoengineering community to uh, emulate that of the recombinant DNA community at the famous Asilomar Asilomar meeting on recombinant DNA a few decades back. Uh, and the Economist, as The Economist reported, the Oxford Principles were widely accepted by the participants in the Asilomar meeting. And they certainly seem as though they're going to be part of the next phase of the Royal Society's so-called Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative. So if we're unsuccessful, I think we might end up like the guy on the right here. Um, but uh, I think the stakes are so high here that we really can't afford not to succeed. Thank you.